So you realize your mother has is the one who shot him. Mm -hmm. You feel pretty good about it. Well, I'm happy for mom. She doesn't have to deal with him anymore. Because it ain't right to have to be mentally fucking abused and tortured on a daily basis. Nobody should have to do that. Whoever's doing the abusing, yes, they should be dead, rather. In my mind, logic tells me that everybody should feel that way. I think a lot of people do feel that way. No, but you know what I mean? Like society, uh, to me, that's the normal way to feel. If you have only two choices, either you he abuses her or he dies. Well, I figure that he should be dead. I don't give a fuck if it's my parents, your parents, or anyone's parents, or anybody. The abuser should be dead rather than the victim. He usually goes the, the usually other way. The reality up, we see is yes, that the victim. But, you know, like if anyone should, should be dead and shouldn't have to deal with it anymore, it would have been her, mm -hmm. right? In my mind, well, that's what you get for being an asshole. You treat people like that, what do you expect to happen? There's actually a history of juries in Canada finding women not guilty of killing their abusive husbands, even after the women admitted to doing it. But the system itself is stacked against them. The battered woman defense, as it's called, came to prominence in Canada in a case that had a lot in common with Helen's. And to understand how it could be used to defend Helen, though she'd confessed to shooting Miles in the back of the head while he was sleeping, we need to go back to the 1987 trial of Angelique Lynn Lavallee. Her case would go all the way to the Supreme Court and change Canadian law. I'm Jana Pruden, and this is In Her Defense, from The Globe and Mail. Episode 5, The Battered Woman Defense. In the beautiful world, why did I, da, 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 I, So historically, we never treated wife murder and husband murder as the same kind of uh, criminal act. Women's act of husband killing was always seen as much more morally culpable, uh, diabolical, and upending of the social order, in fact. This is Dr. Elizabeth Sheehy. She taught law at the University of Ottawa for 35 years. She literally wrote the book on defending battered women on trial. It's called Defending Battered Women on Trial. It was considered to be accidental use of excess force when men killed their wives. In contrast, women who killed their husbands were charged with the unique crime of petty treason. So we know that treason is killing the king. Petty treason is killing the master. Now, that could be the master of a household, but it also meant a woman's master who was her husband. So petty treason was a specific form of murder that was considered more heinous than ordinary murder um, and had a very special punishment, uh, a form of public execution. So, you know, I would say those ideas continue to linger in, in many ways in our society. I think that women killing is almost seen as every day. It's very easy for people to see wife killing as accidental somehow or mitigated by our understanding that men sometimes lose control or women can be frustrating, um, whereas husband killing is still seen as a matter of very, very serious offending and upending of our social order. Angelique Lynn Lavallee was 21 when she killed her boyfriend, Kevin Rust. It was the summer of 1986. I think the two of them had argued and fought several times. She'd gone upstairs to an upstairs bedroom, and he'd gone upstairs to confront her. Her 
statements um, to others and to police when she was arrested was that he told her, shoot me or I'll shoot you. And she also said that he said he would get her later after the party when their guests had left. And so she shot at him as he was exiting the bedroom to return to the party. The Crown had a strong case for murder. At the time, an argument of self-defense required an imminent threat, sometimes described as the uplifted knife or the pointed gun. That would mean an attacker coming toward you, not walking away unarmed with their back turned. Self-defense also rested on what the hypothetical, quote, reasonable or ordinary man would do. You're probably getting the sense from that language that these laws were written by and for men. The original law of self-defense was really framed around men's experiences of an equal person fighting another person, you know, who has the same level maybe of power and, uh, and strength. But there was growing awareness at the time about the unique circumstances of domestic violence. And Angelique Lavallee's lawyer wanted to fight the murder charge with a claim of self-defense. Her defense lawyer introduced expert evidence about what's called battered woman syndrome in her trial. Battered woman syndrome is based on the pioneering research of American clinical psychologist Lenore Walker. She divided the cycle of domestic abuse into three phases. Tension building, then acute acting out of violence or threat, and then thirdly, contrition. So it's said to be a cyclical pattern that keeps a woman entrapped and in a state of fear and anxiety about what's going to happen next. And Lenore Walker basically said that a woman who's gone through that cycle more than two times is a battered woman. So someone who is truly, you know, entrapped in the relationship and unable to escape. During the trial, the defense called psychiatrist Fred Shane as an expert on battered woman syndrome. His testimony was intended to help jurors understand what Lavallee did in the context of the abuse she'd endured. So, you know, an expert like Dr. Shane was there to testify that the experiences of Lynn Lavallee and her behaviors, how she reacted to Russ violence, were consistent with battered woman syndrome, but also talks about the collective experience of, of women and the collective experience of men who engage in this kind of violence. Angelique Lavallee herself never testified. The Lavallee case was the first trial in Canada where a jury was told they could find a woman not guilty based on the battered woman defense. And they did. 11 men and one woman unanimously found her not guilty of second-degree murder. After the verdict, defense lawyer Greg Brodsky said when Angelique Lavallee killed her boyfriend that night, she wasn't just reacting to the assault of the moment, but to her whole history as a battered woman. The Crown appealed the verdict, arguing that allowing Dr. Shane to testify about the battered woman defense turned the case into a trial by psychiatrist. The Court of Appeal agreed, but Brodsky appealed that decision to the country's highest court. The case went before the Supreme Court in October of 1989. Among the judges deciding the appeal was Bertha Wilson, Canada's first female Supreme Court justice. In her eight years on the Supreme Court, Justice Wilson had been a strong advocate for the rights of women. In 1988, she was one of the five justices who struck down the law preventing women from getting abortions in Canada. And she went the furthest in her writing on that case, saying reproductive freedom was part of women's path to true equality. In February of 1990, as the court was deciding on the Lavallee case, she gave a lecture to a packed house at Osgoode Hall Law School. We found a tape of that speech, which was broadcast in full on a radio program called Forum. 
We think this may be one of the only copies out there. Good evening. Tonight we begin the fourth annual Barbara Betjerman Lecture, presented by Osgood Hall Law School of York University. The speaker is Madam Justice Bertha Wilson, the first woman to be appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada. She'll give a lecture entitled, Will Women Judges Really Make a Difference? Here's Madam Justice. While the lecture wasn't about the Lavalet case, it's relevant because we know that Bertha Wilson was considering the case at the time. I think that a distinctly male perspective is clearly discernible and has resulted in legal principles that are not fundamentally sound and should be revisited as and when the opportunity presents itself. Some aspects of the criminal law in particular cry out for change since they are based on presuppositions about the nature of women and women's sexuality that in this day and age are little short of ludicrous. As one newspaper story from the time characterized it, Zing. Thank you very much. My understanding is that the crowd erupted in applause and a long standing ovation. And within days, there, I mean, there were all sorts of newspaper headlines reporting on her speech. But within days, there were also complaints made to the Canadian Judicial Council that she was a biased feminist. (laughs) So, and some of those were made, I think, by defense lawyers. So, you know, there was not universal uh, appreciation for her remarks, I can tell you that. The Supreme Court decision in Lavallee came down three months later. That speech, I think, (laughs) we all know now, was a foreshadowing of the judgment that was to be released. It was written by Justice Wilson. The court unanimously ruled that Angelique Lavallee's lawyer was allowed to call expert evidence on the battered woman syndrome. The not guilty verdict would stand. And so Justice Wilson said, you know, this evidence is not only legally relevant, but it's important for jurors to hear to assist them in identifying and setting aside their own stereotyped beliefs, which many of us hold. So not only... Did she rule, and the court agree with her, that this evidence was relevant to these elements of self-defense, and this evidence is relevant to educate jurors, but she also put to rest other impediments to women's access to self-defense. Those other impediments included the idea of an imminent threat, that uplifted knife or pointed gun. Justice Wilson wrote that the cycle of domestic abuse makes it predictable, unlike a bar fight or an attack on the street, and that it's possible for a battered woman to predict violence even before it happens. She quoted an American court that said making a battered woman wait until she's being beaten to defend herself is like sentencing her to murder by installment. And that's because in hand-to-hand combat, most women will never be able to save their own lives against a violent male partner. Justice Wilson also took on the idea of a reasonable or ordinary man, writing that if it strains credulity to imagine what the ordinary man would do in the position of a battered spouse, it is probably because men do not typically find themselves in that situation. The definition of what is reasonable must be adapted to the circumstances which are, by and large, foreign to the world inhabited by the hypothetical reasonable man. And she went on to say, you know, the ordinary man she doubts has ever experienced battering. And therefore, you know, we can't use that standard. We have to use a standard that incorporates women's experiences as well as men's um, into our understanding of criminal law. And finally, Bertha Wilson wrote that it was not for a jury to pass judgment on why a battered woman stayed in a relationship. And she took on the age-old question, why didn't she just leave? She wrote, Traditional self-defense doctrine does not require a person to retreat from her home instead of defending herself. A man's home may be his castle, but it is also the woman's home, even if it seems to her more like a prison in the circumstances. 
The other thing I wanted to say about the Lavalet decision is that I think it remains one of the most progressive decisions on self-defense for battered women in the world. I think that's because she took apart and identified all these stereotypes that lurk beneath the surface. The Lavalet decision was controversial. Some said it signaled open season on husbands. It didn't. But the case did set an important precedent. And it showed what was possible in defending women who killed their abusers. 30 years later, the Lavalet case would be Helen's best chance of avoiding spending her life in prison. My age, a first-degree murder charge was a distance. At the end of her five-and-a-half-hour interrogation by RCMP, Helen Nasland had admitted she shot her husband Miles in the back of the head while he was sleeping. She was charged with first-degree murder. So was her youngest son, Neil. They were also both charged with offering an indignity to a dead body for disposing of Miles after they killed him. Wes was charged for that, too. Daryl, who had turned his mother and brothers in, wasn't facing any charges. I don't know. In a way, it was a relief. Was, yeah. No more trying to hide, no more trying to cover it up. I mean, it was... It's almost like the, my life had come to an end. One thing a lot of people don't realize is how confusing it is to be in jail. From the moment you're arrested... You're moving through a system that you may not really understand, with little or no communication with the outside world. What do you remember about your, your first night in custody at the Remand Center? Huh. Oh, that was worse, worse than hell, as you would read or know about what people say hell is. That was worse than that. that was worse than anything I'd ever been through. Just, uh, wasn't that I was being beat or abused, but it was just the, uh, you know, the mentalness around it, it was excruciating, really excruciating. And the pain of that night is from, like, being in custody and being imprisoned, or was it from the physical environment there? What what was everything? The environment, the like I said, the, I thought that was the end of my life. Like, uh, no. <clears throat> I mean, I knew I wasn't going to die on the spot, but I don't know. I don't know how to put it into words. It was just. My life had ended. What it was going to be like after that, I didn't know. It wasn't going to be a life. A first-degree murder conviction in Canada is an automatic life sentence, with no chance of parole for 25 years. At the time, Helen was 52. She had no previous criminal record. Paying for a lawyer isn't cheap. Helen was almost bankrupt before the charges. They'd sold off almost all their land and their livestock. They had really nothing of value. Helen's boss, Guy Turnbull, and his wife, Lisa, stepped up and offered to pay for the defense. You know, a lot of bosses wouldn't have anything, you know, to do with it. Why did you still help Helen? Why did you support Helen? Because I didn't blame her if she did. You know, I've seen what was going on for years, like, you know, just little bits and pieces. And I think, like, who would live with this? Why wouldn't you leave? Well, I know why she couldn't leave, because she was threatened every day, every day of her life, and she was scared to death. It's only, I think the only reason you get rid of that problem is to take care of yourself. What else are you going to do? I don't know that. I've never been in that situation, so for me to sit here and say that is pretty hard, but I can only imagine, right? Why would anybody put a man, man or lady, right? Helen and Neil watched their own bail hearings through closed-circuit television from separate cells at the Edmonton Remand Centre. Wes had already made bail, but the Crown was opposing Helen and Neil's release, 
meaning they would have to stay in jail for a year or two until they went to trial. Domestic violence did play a role in the way the Crown considered the case, but only with Helen as the attacker and Miles as victim. The Crown said in Helen's case, the victim of domestic violence homicide was the male party. But the judge agreed to release them. The Edmonton Journal reported at the time that mother and son wiped away tears when they heard the decision. Bail came with strict conditions. Helen would be on house arrest, totally controlled and monitored. Actually, I was really, I was okay with it. I didn't have a problem with it all because like I said, it was something that I was accustomed to. It was basically how my life was. Helen's sister, Sharon, started going to Helen's court appearances. And it was only then that she realized the full extent of what her younger sister had been living with. It was devastating. Uh, I think because I, I, I honestly didn't think it, I, I didn't realize it was that bad. I, I, and I guess, I guess it was, and I think having been through it myself, I didn't realize why I didn't see it. Do you feel bad about that? Yes. It wasn't a big deal that he was dead. And how or why didn't, and it still doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. But I, I will support Helen and, you know, and the, the boys. Battered women cases are complex and uncommon. As we've heard, a jury could well be convinced to find Helen not guilty. But going to trial for murder is also a huge gamble. With Neil charged too, the stakes were no less than the rest of both of their lives. And after getting her out on bail, Helen's lawyer told her he couldn't continue with the case. Because Greg just didn't feel confident. He he knew that he wasn't, wasn't the lawyer for those charges. I mean, he's a criminal lawyer, but it's more different kind of stuff, not not murder charges and yeah. battered women. It's just, yeah, he just didn't feel that he would uh, had what it took to do that. Yeah. Helen found a new lawyer, Kevin Lessler. He didn't respond to my request for an interview, but Helen says he wanted to go to trial with the battered woman defense. That was his goal he was reaching for. It was uh, to get that information out there and present a case. He was really into it, should I say. Like he was, he had a rush, a drive. It was his need. Like he really wanted to go to trial. That's all he talked about. It was the events, how things were going to play out. A lot of our meetings were in the courtroom, just an empty courtroom, because that's how he wanted it. Hmm. Because he needed to make sure that I was going to be okay with that environment. And and it wasn't all friendly. Like, he put himself in the crown shoes as well, and it was horrible. (laughs) It was good, but it was horrible. With Kevin... um Did you get a sense of how he felt about um, how that play, how that your case would play out in front of a jury? Did he feel, you know, was he nervous about it? Did he seem to feel like you had a strong case? Did did you get a sense of how how he felt that would go? Yeah, I got a good, like he made me feel assured, reassured, I guess, that, I mean, he... He thought things would go good. Mm-hmm. His hope was that we would walk out of there over the front door together at the end of it all. But that didn't happen. Kevin had some health problems and told Helen he had to quit the case. Instead, he recommended a new lawyer, Darren Sprake. Darren is a well-respected lawyer in Edmonton. 
He didn't respond to my request for an interview, but it's clear he had a different view of Helen's case. Helen says he thought she should take a plea deal. That would mean no trial and no gamble on the battered woman defense. She would plead guilty, and the Crown would take life in prison off the table. He didn't want to go to trial. I don't think he wanted to fight that hard. He didn't. I don't know. They were just, they were totally different lawyers. I don't know what else to say. But there again, I, I knew nobody else. I, and I wasn't the one putting the money up either, so I felt like I didn't have full control of what was happening either. Those closest to her were divided about what she should do. Her boss, Guy Turnbull, who was paying for the defense, also thought Helen should take a deal. And he told her that. I'm sure you probably weren't privy to all of the legal discussions happening, but do you remember when you, you know, heard about what was going to happen with the case and what you thought? Well, I knew all about it because they, they met with me too. Oh, okay. Lawyers met with me through all this whole thing. And I had some input into it. Yeah. And I'm the one that told her to to go along with with what the deal they made. Because I said, I know enough that you, you're not going to get out of first degree. Yeah. Because there was enough evidence to put her away from first degree. So what's the point of taking a gamble on that? Because you're gambling. Sharon wasn't so sure. I talked to her about it, and I thought at the time that her being able to to say her piece would have been good for her. Like he, he wasn't the, the great neighbor and the, there was a lot more to him and, and to her life. And um, again, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't actually know what happened. And, and I, it doesn't matter, and I don't need, to, I don't want to know. So I, I think lots of what she did was to protect the boys. And let's just say that Wes was not into it. Again, there's quite a bit of swearing in this bit. I told her not to do it. It was a fucking bullshit thing. They don't have the evidence that they say they do, and if you fight it, you'll win. I told her it was a bullshit thing. There's no way that a woman should be beaten all her goddamn life and then finally stand up and shoot her fucking husband in the sleep in the back of the head because she's lost her fucking mind. And she can't take being fucking mentally abused and called down and treated like a fucking dog anymore. She lost her shit. People do that when they're abused like that. It's not their fucking fault. She should have never even fucking seen the inside of a jail cell. Because you know what? If they, if she wouldn't have shot him, and she would have had proof and videos and shit of all the shit that he did, she never would have seen the inside of a jail cell, and everybody would have thrown him in jail forever. They would have, well, he would have been in for five years with the way that works. Look at all the rest of the cases that you see. If anything, you should fucking offer counseling, therapy. Instead of trying to torture somebody worse and make it worse, why don't you try and fix the mind? That's what I think. And I told her that. I told her, if you fight it, guaranteed they won't. You won't get the murder charge, because that's what they're throwing at her. If you don't take it, you're going for murder indefinitely. And I told her, no, it's not fucking murder. If anything, it's manslaughter. If anything more like self-defense. But Helen had to decide for herself whether to take a plea deal or go to trial for murder. It was a huge decision. That's next time on In Her Defense. To get the best for Neil, that's, that was my biggest concern. I think that the outcome was a just one for everyone involved, which is always satisfying for the Crown. I was well and truly shocked. I was fuming when I read the judge's comments. In Her Defense is made by Kasia Mihailovich and me, Jana Pruden. 
Field recording by Amber Bracken. Special thanks today to Jamie Cameron for unearthing the tape of Bertha Wilson's famous Osgood Hall speech. Sorry for all the pestering, Jamie. In Her Defense is recorded at McEwen University by Sheena Rossiter, Emily Rubiita, and Sasha Stanoyevich. Our executive editor is Angela Pacenza. Special thanks to head of visual journalism, Matt Frainer, and head of editing, Ian Bokoff. David Crosby mixes the show. Also thanks today to Stephanie Chambers for research assistance and Peter Sankoff for a bit of legal fact-checking. Our theme song is The Fighter by Jen Grant. I listened to the song about a thousand times while I was reporting this story, and I'm so grateful she let us use it on the show. Arrangement by David Crosby. I would love to hear from you. You can email me personally at jprudeen at globeandmail.com. We would also love for you to help us share Helen's story. Please share this podcast, tell people about it, rate and review it wherever you're listening. It really does help get the word out. If you're experiencing domestic violence and want to talk to someone, you can find resources and your nearest shelter at sheltersafe.ca. To support journalism like this, consider subscribing to The Globe and Mail. Our listeners get a special discount on new subscriptions at www.globeandmail.com slash podcast deal. Take care and thank you for listening.